I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club, a podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome. Hello and welcome to episode 158 of Dark and Stormy Book Club. Today we visit with Jackie Flom. Enjoy! Award-winning author Jackie Ross Flom began her career as a reporter for the Hartford Courant in Hartford, Connecticut. After moving to Memphis and abandoning reality for fiction, she won first place for the romantic suspense in the 21st annual Duel on the Delta and second place in spring 2019 Short Storyland online competition. She is happily married, has two daughters, four grandchildren, and one dog. Currently, she is president of Malice in Memphis, a killer writing group. Justice Tomorrow is a self-published book. Who lynched Henry Johnson? Young investigators Madeline Sterling and Socrates Gray had a team sent to a Georgia town in 1965 to learn who lynched the son of a local civil rights leader. Sterling doesn't have her head on straight from her last assignment, and Gray knows pretty little Crossville, Georgia, is no place for her or the handsome rookie she's training to be a detective for the civil rights group Justice Tomorrow. The town is seething with rage. Both black and white communities are lashing out at the wrong enemy. Sterling and Gray suspect someone is using prejudice, murder, arson, and feuds dating back to the Civil War to hide larceny on a grand scale. But it's hard to think when they're fighting a forbidden attraction. Suddenly, their lives are in danger, and time is running out for the investigations. Sterling and Gray must unravel a hundred-year-old murder to get justice for Henry Johnson and somehow get out alive. We would like to welcome Jackie Ross Flom to our program. She has a powerful book called Justice Tomorrow. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to be here. Justice Tomorrow was a powerful story of an effort to bring equality and justice to the 1960s South. Was the murder of Henry Johnson based on an actual death during that time? If so, was his murderer ever brought to justice? No, actually, you go to the Southern Poverty Law Center and go to the wall. Of, I think they call it the Wall of Heroes. And it's a whole series of stories about people who were murdered in sometimes horrific ways for the cause of justice or just because they were black. Some of these murders were actually brought to justice and some weren't. That was where the lynching scene came from. It wasn't an actual case per se. It wasn't actually one. All the characters and all the events that I portray in this book are pieces of actual events or actual people that I know. I only know how to write real people. I just write about them in pieces. I might take one person's laugh and one person's disposition and one person's stride or history and kind of mush them up all together and see if it all sticks together. Think of it as making meatballs. Ah, that's a fun way to think of it. <laughs> you make a character the way you make meatballs. At some point you say, I have too much sausage in this, or I have too much pepper. So you add or subtract. And that's sort of the way you create a character until you get the perfect meatball or the perfect character. That character or event becomes real for you. And if it doesn't become real or that person isn't real for you, then you cannot possibly make it real for the reader. I think, from the reviews and the comments that I've received, I made the characters real. Definitely. You did. There are only really a couple of people that are characters that are real. Do you find that every character has to be real? 
Oh, no. No, I so. think it gets too confusing if you've got too many voices in a book, especially a story like this. Sterling, you wanted that to come through, not a lot of background noise. I like Sterling. She is one of my favorite characters of all time because she is smart. She's vulnerable. She makes a mistake. She falls in love. She has unrequited love. I mean, all these things are played against the backdrop of a horrific system of racism and murder and injustice. But if you don't have some relief from all that, it gets tedious to the point where, I don't know if you all have read Mississippi Burning or oh, yes. uh, some of Greg Isle's books about Natchez Burning. Sometimes I think those books are so horrific and so intense that it's like running a road race. You just yeah. get exhausted. I hope that Justice Tomorrow isn't like that. I hope there is a little break for people from the intensity. Oh, yeah, there was some humor in there. You did a great job of a good balance. Oh, good. Thank you. That's what I was aiming for. You ask about was this ever based on something that actually happened. Back in the late 60s, there was an organization that decided to demonstrate for people the inequality in housing. So they hired two, a white girl and a black man as a couple and a similar black couple. They gave them similar backgrounds. They gave them similar bank accounts, similar everything. Even to the point, I remember that the women wore the same dress. And they went to real estate companies and asked to be shown houses. They wanted to buy a house. What it showed, to no one's surprise, is that black couples were steered in one direction, white couples in another, and black couples couldn't get the house they wanted, but white couples could. And I started thinking, what would happen if instead of being investigators for housing, those same people were investigating civil rights murders, like the ones that you see depicted on the Heroes Wall at the Southern Poverty Law Center website? Mm -hmm. And I got real into that. What would happen? Someone back then, journalists were the ones who were actually doing it the most, but what if there was a secret organization that sent people out, like these black and white couples, into their own communities to find out who killed all these people and to gather evidence against them so that at some point there could be justice in southern courtrooms? Because remember, they tried white people for black murders all the time, and they rarely, the if ever, yeah. I love the University of Georgia. So I went there for a whole year. The first thing I remember, I led a very sheltered life in Kentucky. And my parents were driving me to school. And we stopped to go to the bathroom in this little Georgia town. And I saw white women, black women restrooms. And it was the first time in my life that racism and discrimination actually smacked me between the eyes. Actually, I put that incident in justice tomorrow. Sterling never quite gets over that either. I was truly stunned. It was really the first time I had seen in black and white that institutional racism was a real thing. Up until then, it was just something you saw on TV. There should have been an organization if there wasn't one. It wouldn't it be wonderful, but I have never been able to find them. If indeed there is such an organization, I would love to tell your story. But I couldn't find one, so I made one up. I thought it was actually nope. very clever. On my website, there is a little backstory for Sterling and for Gray as to how they came to be part of Justice Tomorrow. It's a very short little vignette about Sterling and a little short vignette about Gray to talk about how they got involved. You can go on my website, www.jrflom.com. Read those stories about them, although you don't have to, to know about them in the book. No, their story came through very well. You said you were sheltered growing up in Kentucky. We kind of assumed that being raised in the South, you would have witnessed quite a lot of hate and discrimination, but it doesn't sound like it until you got out of your comfort zone. Right. I really was sheltered. My mother went to school in Georgia at Bernal. She would tell me stories about life in Georgia. And hers was not the same story I was hearing on TV. In my hometown in Kentucky, integration was don't ever remember it being a big thing. What happened was the black high school in my town was in terrible shape. So rather than build a new one and go to all that expense, they just integrated. So that was a very interesting business decision. Exactly. And, money talks. <laughs> right. I was a freshman at the old high school, I think the second year of the integration. I don't remember a thing. 
Now, I know there were incidences, boys being stupid and girls being twice as stupid. Isn't that awful what she did? You know, that kind of thing. So my friends never put up with that kind of stuff. We just integrated. That was the end of it. And then I went to the University of Georgia, and it was, hello, Jackie, welcome to reality. Yeah. Sterling is a very good character, and so is Gray. Will their story continue in another installment of the book? Yes, and thank you for asking. I'm working on a sequel called Price of a Future, which follows Sterling and Gray, too, through, how can I say this without giving it away? There are things that happen in the book to Sterling that she has to deal with. Meanwhile, Justice Tomorrow, which is the organization that has hired and supported Gray and Sterling and all the other agents, is threatened. That has to be dealt with. What happens to Justice Tomorrow? And then what happens to Gray and his brother, Aristotle, when they are trying to be safe from all the fallout from Justice Tomorrow? So there are several storylines that have to be picked up in Price of a Future. This next story deals with another issue that happened in the 1950s and 60s, which is the baby thefts. I don't know if you recall this, but in the 50s and 60s, girls who got into trouble, quote, end quote, went to places to have their babies. Then most of the time, it was felt that the baby would be better off with a mother and a father as opposed to just a mother. So these women were encouraged to give up their children. In many cases, that encouragement took the form of coercion. This is one of the storylines that we're going to be following in Price of the Future. I'll definitely be looking forward to it. Well, thank you. This book is going to be published in the summer, which means I have to get cracking on it. When it comes out, be sure and let us know so we can get it. Be the a... first to read it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. I absolutely will let you know. I'm excited about it. It's halfway done. I just have to be not distracted by all these short stories. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about all the characters in Justice Tomorrow, how did you come up with such wonderful, unique names? You mean for Socrates Gray and his brother Aristotle Gray? Silver. Oh, they nickname him Silver because he hangs out with Madeline Sterling, and his mm. name is Gray. So they yeah. couldn't have two Grays in the training program. The people in the training camp came up with the name Silver for him. It fit with the character Socrates Gray to have and Aristotle Gray. I wanted them to be sons of very well-educated people, teachers, who valued the classics and taught their sons to use proper grammar and to read, listen to opera. At one point during Justice Tomorrow, you remember Aristotle longed for the days when he can go to the symphony again, <laughs> take a shower on a regular basis. That really is Silver's thing. He loves showers. And also, they are educated men themselves and value that in others. Their names fit their characters. Now, Sterling, I just happened to like the name Sterling. I wanted to name someone. It had to be Madeline Sterling. Madeline was kind of a throwaway name. It just happened to come up in the rotation of names that I use. I kind of forgot her name was Madeline because she was just Sterling. That's what she prefers. And she explains to the, her new friends in Georgia that her father always said she was named after silverware. That's how I came up with the names. I really didn't have anything nefarious going on about it. I wanted something that showed how educated and what fine educators Socrates and Aristotle had in their background. It's part of who they are, actually, that happens to them because of the fact that their parents were such educated people. Looking at your website, you design jewelry. I do. It's my stress reliever. Are you going to design so something for Justice Tomorrow? Actually, I need to get my act together and put it up on the website. You already know how I love technology. Getting anything up on my website is just all-day process for me. But I've already designed the Sterling necklace is white with little silver in it. Crossville, Georgia is the name of the town where Justice Tomorrow is set. So I have a Crossville necklace set, and it's red because, if you recall, Crossville is a fire. They are aflame with rage at the wrong people, as it turns out. And then, of course, I have grays. It's black with silver in it. I need to get the, off the dime and put those up. Now, you mentioned spending a lot of time writing short stories. I'm curious why this story needed to be full length. Did it start out as a short story? 
Justice Tomorrow began and finished as a novel. That was the first thing I actually created. Then I began to write short stories because of the discipline. I belong to a 